introducing me and thanks for putting this much of effort for this event. It's really amazing. It's my first time in JFocus, actually. And thanks you all for coming to my talk uh, about web components with Angular. So, my name is Sherry Liz, and I work as Azure Developer Technical Lead at Microsoft. I'm based in Copenhagen uh, in Denmark, and I have uh, a lot of passion for all the community project, and I have a big tendency to make myself involved in anything. And uh, I'm a woman tech maker lead of Copenhagen, uh, which made me also to be one of the organizers of uh, Women tech, uh, Woman tech Makers Copenhagen. Uh, and also I'm a, one of the organizers of GDG uh, Copenhagen, which stands for Google Developer Group. And uh, I'm one of the organizers of uh, NG Copenhagen as well. Uh, any of you heard of NG Vikings? Okay, we have a few. Okay. Um, NG Viking is a 100% uh, non profit and uh, community, uh, community driven conference, which I'm one of the co founder of it. And uh, it's the beauty of it, it's the result of collaboration among all the Angular Meetup organizers in the whole Nordic. Minus Iceland, because we're still looking for some passionate Viking from Iceland who loves also uh, Angular. We're still looking for that, but plus Spain. And uh, it happens actually all across the... Uh, each year it's in different country, and this year it's going to be in Copenhagen in May. Um, you're all welcome to join there. Um, and uh, the other thing is I'm also one of the organizers of NG Spain, which is the same format, but in Spain. So if you want to have Angular and Solecito, maybe you can come to Madrid in October to NG Spain. And uh, the other thing is that I'm one of the board member of another association, which is called Hack Your Future. Uh, not sure if you heard of that because it's happening everywhere in the world. Uh, I'm part of the Copenhagen chapter of that, which is a code school uh, for refugees and also all the underrepresented groups that they want to join the tech uh, to actually to the job market in, in Denmark uh, as a developer. So we have a very well structured format for the course and in 2018 actually we could achieve uh, to a big portion of our graduates they actually they got a full-time job as a developer. And we already set up a really uh, big, uh, what they call it, that goal for 2019 to actually do more. So enough about me. If you want to hear about any of these projects, or if you want to have uh, actually stickers from any of these projects, you can find me after the after this talk. Okay. So we are here to learn about web component. So what we are going to do today, we are going to have a very thin overview about that. What Angular components are, and from there we are going to learn what web components are, and we are going to build the web components all together. And after that, we are going to find out how to build that with Angular and also add it to an existing Angular project. And uh, later on, we are going to find out okay, how to uh, actually what is next, or what are the projects that we have to keep track of it because they are soon coming uh, into the web component world. So. Okay, any of you ever build any component with Angular View React? Okay, so we all know what is this. Good, because I didn't put many slides here. <laughs> so, so in 2013, Facebook with React introduced web comp uh, actually introduced component-based architecture, which is one way of applying the separation of concern on web. And soon after that, almost all the other frameworks, including Angular, adopted it as well. So as we know that we can, we can actually, if this is a, a one example of Sherry's Bear's website, that, uh, that you can see that all of these rectangles, they are one component. And the whole application in Angular is also one component. And uh, why we do that? Because of course we can make uh, smaller blocks and, uh, and then orchestrate our whole application by all of these components and then uh, have a fully uh, functional uh, application. And because of that, we are going to have a smaller code to maintain, and it's going to be our code is going to be easier to follow and testable and, and all of those. So this is really good. Uh, this is what we love. But it's not enough because we're still missing some part. 
I'm pretty sure that uh, almost all of you, most probably, that you've been in a situation that you created a really lovely component and it worked, everything was, uh, was fantastic until somebody committed something in the global CSS. And boom, your component doesn't work in a way that you, you actually wanted it to work. And uh, it's because that in this way, we don't have an actual style encapsulation, which means that we, don't, uh, we are not going to have any leak in or out. There are ways to fix it, um, or like having applying BIM name, naming conversion, but we want to have a real style encapsulation. And of course, once we have that, what we need to do is that uh, our code most probably is going to be shared in the different um, teams and different places as well. Even though that is totally uh, encapsulated, we want to be able to apply some theming. We want to customize it as well. And uh, speaking of reusing across the team, that if you're especially working in the bigger companies, uh, we want to, as a developer, we want to have the freedom of using the the frameworks that we want to. Maybe my team love Angular and then have a lot of competence in Angular, but there is another team across there that they want to use Vue or React or they want to use Polymer or nothing. So we should give freedom to all the developers to, to use the frameworks that they want to, but at the same time, we are also, since we are lazy developers, we don't want to rewrite everything. We want to write a lot of component once and reuse it across the teams. And um, the other thing is that we want flexibility. And most probably you know a JSX, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. And, but, but for example, in Angular, we don't have that JSX. And, uh, and we don't want to yet introduce another templating language. We have enough of that. So we want to have uh, kind of that flexibility without reinventing the wheel as well. So, if Angular doesn't have it, if Vue doesn't have it, so what have it? Ta-da, web components. So web components actually um, providing all of these missing bits and pieces that we talk, to, talk about. So it's a, it's a component, uh, they are components that they build in a way that they have that actual encapsulation from the beginning. And, uh, and also, they are totally platform agnostic. So we can finally produce a components that we want to uh, and then reuse it disregard of which frameworks is going to be used. Uh, so, so this is all of the things that we really wanted to have. But when we are talking about the frameworks, actually, not all the frameworks fully supported the web components. Rob Dodson from Polymer team uh, he has many awesome projects, but one of them is this custom elements everywhere. So you can go there and then check out the frameworks that you're using today, if it's uh, supporting web components or not, and how, what is the status of it. Most of them, they're already supporting it, but there are some of them, they have some, uh, some missing part as well. So you can go there and check out the status of the frameworks that you're using today. And, but if you're using Angular, you don't need to be worried about that because Angular was one of the first that the food is, it fully supported uh, uh, custom elements. And so let's find out what actually is web components. Pretty simple. They consisted of three technology. The HTML template, custom elements, and shadow DOM. So there used to be HTML import part of it, uh, but with the ES6 modules, we really don't use them anymore. But if you check out a lot of articles, you can see that um, in many articles, they are already referring to HTML import, but then it's a sign that they say that this article is outdated. So let's uh, start by finding out what HTML template is. It's just pretty simple. It's a HTML tag. And like most of them, it has a start and it has an end. Anything that you put in the middle is going to be considered as your template, and the browser is not going to actually to load it unless you ask for it to, to load it. So it's going to be parsed, it, but it's not going to be loaded. So you need to manually um, actually uh, um, ask the browser to parse it. 
So what we are going to um, actually do together today, we are going to create this very beautiful design, a strawberry history bed, which has these two cards that we are going to, oh, it's so difficult, I'm not going to use this. So, um, so, what we are, uh, so what we are going to do is that we are going to create these cards step by step by applying this technology together. And later on, when I shared my, my slide, you can click on that Stacklist logo and then so see the full code as well. And some of them, they even have GitHub as well. OK, so let's do it. This is, what, this is how to use the, actually, the template tag. So very simple. You just have a start, you have an end, and then you put your HTML there. And later on, of course, inside your page, somewhere you want to have that one to be displayed. So you can create a placeholder for that somewhere. And then later on, what we need to do is that we need to get a reference to our template to have it. And then we are going to say that, OK, inside that template, I want to put this image and I want to put this description as well, so to fill out that template. And then what we need to do is that we want to add it to the template. So then we get a reference from that placeholder that we created before. And what we need, we need to clone the template. That's how we do it in, in the HTML template. We clone it, and then we add it to the DOM. So this is how we add it to the DOM. So, um, and the reason for that is that um, one of the benefits of um, the kind of the template is that um, no matter that how many times you actually clone it and append it to the DOM, the browser is going to parse it one time. And because of that, you can you achieve already a lot of um, um, actually your per, your performance is boosted up already, um, and um, and then. Uh, as you can see, that it was pretty simple. So what you do is that you're going to clone and append it to the DOM. And, uh, and then especially if you want to compare it with the inner HTML, your performance is already boosted so much by just using a template tag. So that was the first technology. And the other one is custom element. So the one that you already created, you said that you, are, uh, you already created the, the component, you know that you normally create a tag for your component. That is custom element. So uh, by custom, custom elements, they are ES6 classes that they are inherited from the uh, HTML element. And you can either extend one of the existing HTML tag there. For example, you can extend a tag. You can have a fancy a tag. Or you can create your own custom element. So let's see that how we can do that. Oh, before that, we have this, uh, this thing that when, once we're creating a new tag, you try to be a little bit creative, because especially if you want to share your tag, uh, your component with a, with a lot of um, other developers, you don't want to have a red button, because there might be another 10 red buttons out there. And with the current technology that we have, not all the browsers that can find out that which red button to to actually to use. Uh, Polymer is already working on that. I mean, there will be a, a HTML a module uh, that is going to fix that issue. But for now, try to be creative. But actually, at the same time, maybe not so creative. So when you have uh, either attribute or, uh, or try to have a, a function, a, 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 an event, try to be a bit descriptive. And don't say that, ah, oh, OK, uh, I, I Anybody can go and see the source code. Of course not. So even it's for your future. And there, are, uh, there is a big uh, guideline about that, how to create all of these um, web components. I put it in the resources. You can go and, and look at it. One of them is gold standard, that it has a very instructive set of gold um, uh, standards, how to create it. OK, so custom elements, they have life cycle. So uh, in this table, actually, you can see that uh, you can compare it with Angular reactor views. So they have constructor, and they have connected callback. And connected callback is going to be called as soon as your custom elements is appended to the DOM. I'm going to show you that when to use that one. And then disconnected callback is when you remove it from the DOM. And then attribute 
uh, change callback is going to be called as soon as your attribute uh, to actually your input to the component is changed, just like Indian change in Angular as well. So we are going to create a BB-red uh, strawberry, and BB stands for Sherry, Berry, and Anna Banana. And that's me and my friend that we normally give this talk together. So we've been very creative in uh, having a unique name. So this component has two input. And let's see that how to create that. OK, so as I told you that, they are just ES6 classes. So you create an ES6 class with a BB bread or strawberry element, and it inherited from the HTML element. And um, of course, inside the constructor, we call super to have access to all the parents API. And this is implicit unless you want to change it. You don't need to put it there. And once you have it, you're just going to define your custom element. So we said that custom element does that's defined. And that was the class that I already created before. And this is the tag I want to generate. You just made it. So this is a custom element. And, but we already also have some input. And we want to get it and then append it to our template. So how to do that? We should use a connected callback. So connected callback, as I, as I told you that this is the first place that is the first callback is going to be called as soon as it's appended to the DOM. So this is the best place to have a reference to the template. So what we did here, we just said that, OK, this is, the, this is our template. I got it. And then I created a render function. And inside the render function, we just say that, OK, this description that I got it, put it here. This is the image that I got it, put it here. And of course, some if condition that if it doesn't exist, so it, we just pass something as a default to it as well. So we got it. And I told her that we know that those input to the, func the, to the component can be changed at any time. So we have to react to these changes because Right now that it was a strawberry, suddenly user wants to pass uh, for as a result of something uh, an avocado. So we should be able to, to react to that one. So that's where that we are using the attribute change callback. That we just say that, OK, that was the old value. This is a new value. Just change it. So this is what you also are familiar with um, in Angular that you do it. But normally, we don't take care of it unless it's so necessary. But when you are using, when you are not, while you are not using any framework, you have to be aware of that. OK. So this is the result. So we achieved what we wanted to do. We, we used our template, and we have our custom elements and everything. But our dog is not happy. I mean, he looked pretty grumpy, in my opinion. Why? Because if we have in a global CSS, we happen to have a p tag. And what we wanted to do is that one of the p, p tag outside of our custom element to be red, this is what happens. All the p tags, they become red. And this is the encapsulation that I, I was talking about that we needed. So Shadow DOM is here to fix that problem. So Shadow DOM, what it does that it actually is, it created the boundary around our custom elements and provide that encapsulation that I was just talking about it, that, um, that we don't want anything else to be changed there. How to add it? Pretty simple. Inside our custom uh, add, add constructor, what we need to do is say that, OK, I want to have a shadow DOM. And this time, when I clone my template, instead of attaching it directly to the DOM, I attach it to the shadow DOM. So that's simple. We already applied the encapsulation that we wanted to have. OK. It also provides some, some slots. So what are the slots is that um, if we go back to here, we have this encapsulation, but we want to give flexibility to the developers to add different HTML inside that as well. Um, if you ever, for example, use Angular Material, and you wanted to have tab, you see that there are some certain um, kind of the guideline what to put where, which HTML to put where. That's also a slot. So, so even though that is a component, it gives you flexibility to have your own tab. You have your own uh, content over there. So how to do that? Inside your template, you just put a placeholder. So this is an example that 
Uh, for example, in here, for whatever reason, we just decided to give the flexibility to the developer to put uh, to have one slot to add the title in the way that we wanted instead of passing us title and then we present it. We dictate how to be presented. And uh, also the same for the description. So we use a slot tag. It has a beginning and it has a name. And it has a name attribute that you should be aware of that. Because if you have more than one slot you, if you, and you don't give them the name, the content that you put there is not that. You don't think that if you put the one content in an order, the browsers are not going to put it in the way, it may not put it in the way that you want to. They, and then that's not what you want. So remember to put the name for your slot if you have more than one slot. And this is simple. So this is how we use it. So inside, uh, when you have the um, uh, custom elements, you have a div or whatever tag that you want to. You use the slot attribute and you pass the name that you want it. So, and doesn't matter if you, uh, the order does not matter. So you, the, in, the important is that the name of the slot. And inside that tag, in between that tag, you just add uh, any HTML that you want to. This is a very simple example. You can put even more of the components and components there, those building blocks, you can put there and orchestrate it in the way that you want to. And the other one is custom properties. So again, this is the uh, kind of that the uh, boundary that we talked to we talked about. So what we want to do is that we want to give flexibility to the developers to style a component in the, one that, in the way that they want to. Maybe they want to have the background red. They want to have, um, I don't know, another the, diff, uh, the specific behavior for the A tag. So this is the place that uh, as a, um, the CSS custom property is the, is the one that is going to help us. So there is a, uh, this, we are using the CSS variables here. So, and CSS variables, you can use it today without even using a, a web component. It's not specific to web component. But what we do here, inside, the, um, inside the, our CSS in the template, we say that, OK, background color, I want to define a variable called dash dash background color. And that dash dash is, is a naming convention that you have to follow. And as default, I pass white. And how to use it? In, with the style attribute. And you say that, remember there was that dash dash back, uh, background color. Now I want to pass this color instead of white. And you can have as many of these um, uh, custom CSS property as you want to. Uh, but maybe not too many of that, because it's going to easily go out of the hand. And also, um, the, you may have some performance issue. I'm going to tell you that later that how to totally theme our web component. So, Speaking of too many of those CSS variables, remember the documentation. Because you may add all of this flexibility in your component, but if you don't talk about it, if you don't tell uh, to the other developers, they don't know how to use it. And it's also, of course, we all know that if we go back to the component that we created some time ago, we also are not going to remember what we did there, unless we go and see the, the code. OK. so. The other one is host. And uh, host, you most probably already uh, know, familiar with that in Angular today. You can also have host. And what we do here is that we apply the CSS uh, to, the, to our custom element. Instead of wrapping it up in another div just because of the sake of the styling, we can remove one of those div from our div soup. And um, so. We created it. So we applied all of these things together. And now we have a fully functional web component, which even our doggy looks great. Uh, he uh, is so happy. Because if we do the same thing, we have the style encapsulation, and it works. So we made it. We all together created a fully functional web component. And we just all saw that it was so simple. How about our lovely Angular? that we love it so much, and it brings us all of the toolings. We really don't want to do all of these things manual. We want to have CLI and all of those things. OK, we have Angular element. Oh, and I forgot to put the Angular element logo there. Uh, so 
Angular element allows us to create all of this web component with Angular. How to do it? Of course, first we need to install our CLI. We create a project, so these are the flags that I just put it here. Uh, of course, you don't need to put it all the time. And, uh, and then we go inside our um, project that Angular created for us, and we do ng add Angular element. So with that, we already uh, put a lot of, um, um, now we can actually create that. But one thing we have to remember is that we have to have some polyfills. Because some of uh, the browsers are still not fully supporting um, uh, custom elements. And, um, but we have these polyfills there, and the Polymer team, they are, they are taking care of those polyfills. They are pretty smart, and they are very light, so you're not going to have any performance issue. Um, and then, since we have the polyfill, of course, we should go and tell the Angular in the polyfill TS that import this one. And then later on in the TS config, we should say that the target is ES 2015. And that is because of the browsers that they already supporting uh, web components. We should always have that target to ES 2015. Okay, then we use the CLI and say that ng generate component and the name that we want to. This is the result. So, a component, if you want to compare it, so we already have our template there. We have a class here. What we need to add, if we go back to what, what we created before, you see that we had some class, we have shadow DOM, and then we had the custom elements. How to apply these things? If we want to start with the shadow DOM, how to do it in Angular is with view encapsulation. So inside our component, we can have encapsulation and say that view encapsulation is shadow DOM. So you can do it today to even your own component. I mean, this is not new. But with only this line of code, we already applied the uh, encapsulation as well. And then, of course, we bring our template. We just copy paste what we had here. And then we just put our template. We use the Angular interpolation. That's the only thing that we did here, and, and then we have the inputs. And of course, in Angular, we have the input for our component. That's how we create the component. And of course, we have the classes. We can do the optional. And uh, we have the types and everything here. And uh, then one thing is that when you have an inline uh, template, by default, Angular put the display block. So we have to uh, display inline. And we have to change it to the block. And uh, then what we do is that we need to register a component to the ng module. So in addition to put it in a declaration, as we all know that actually Angular just put it there, we need to put the entry component as a, uh, the, the name of component that we just created. Why? Because we are not building a whole application. We are only building one specific component. And we should tell Angular to start from here. So what is missing, if you just look back, is the custom element definition. That's the only part which is missing. How to do that with Angular? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty simple. We just go back to the, um, and to the app module. And we just say that, OK. I want to create a custom element with the help of Angular element. This is the name of my element, cart component. And I want to give a possibility for it to have some injectors as well. And later, we just say that custom element dot, dash def, uh, dot define and the name of custom elements that we want to. So we define the custom elements. And the only thing that we need to do after that, we need to bootstrap it manually, because we are going with the, all of this config, we change the, the whole way that uh, Angular is bootstrapping, is not just bootstrapping from app anymore. So it's a straight away come to this component. OK, uh, so we are going to build it. And then we have um, this component. So this is what we wanted to have. And um, a doggy is uh, super happy because it was super easy. But wait a minute. It was not that easy. Because what we built here, it was a full application. 
what we wanted to achieve, it was a tiny component. So what we are here is a huge bundle which has the whole Angular call, RxJS, everything that an Angular actually, an Angular application needs inside our bundle. And then we also have two bundles. And what we want to have is that to have one bundle and tiny because it was a simple co card component. And when you have a one bundle, we can just import it to the project anywhere that we want, just like the way that we use Angular. We just say that, OK, card import card component from this one. So because of that, we need to have one bundle. There are ways to do it. And most of the time, it's going to end up being in a, in a uh, situation that you eject your, um, your Webpack config and all of those things. So it's complicated. So it's not that we didn't expect it. We wanted to use Angular to just be happy and use all the toolings. A good friend of mine, Manfred Steyer, he created NGX Build Plus. By the way, if you don't follow him, go and follow him, because he's producing fantastic articles and content every day that I even cannot keep track of all the content that he produces every day. And he's an amazing trainer. So he created this NGX Build Plus, and, um, and then with that, we can fix that problem. How? Is this awesome library, he extended the CLI team, the CLI, um, uh, CLI, Angular CLI. And as a result of that, you don't need to do any funky thing to eject and all of those things. And with the help of that library, you can already remove all the unnecessary things that you want. Because just imagine if you create a, uh, an Angular application which has 10 Angular elements with the way that we created, you just imagine you're going to have 11 times Angular core inside your project. That's, what, that's not what you want. So with this one, you can extract them all. And also, with a, uh, you can dynamically add it uh, with the help of a universal module inside your application. I put a link. Uh, from an article that Manfred wrote about how the process in the resources, I totally recommend you go and read that article, that how easily you can do it. So let's use it. What we do, of course, inside our application, we are going to add the ng ngx build plus. And uh, later, you need to go to the Angular uh, JSON and tell Angular that I want to use ngx build plus as my builder. So you create this uh, webpack extra.js, and you put all the stuff that you want to remove from your application, RxJS, Angular core, Angular element. You list them anything that you want to be removed from your application. And then you are going to do the ng build and with the flags that you want to. And then, of course, then you say that, OK, I want to use the Webpack Extra as well. And I also wanted to have a one bundle instead of two bundles that Angular provides for us. So now our component is ready because we built it. And um, of course, one thing that I want to mention that uh, hopefully soon, uh, when we have Ivy, it's going to be way easier for us to extract all of this unnecessary thing because Ivy provides us a lot of flexibility, uh, including that the advanced tree shaking that we have. And then the result of it is not is not going to be uh, it's going to be way closer to how DOM is. So it's going to be very good for building the web components in future. But till that time, we are going to use uh, um, what Manfred created for us. And as far as I also heard that soon, the CLI is also going to, to support that as well. So how to use it? Now we have a web component. Of course, we have to go to an existing Angular project and add our polyfills, as we talked about it before. And then, just like any other component, what we do is that we just import it and then use it. Isn't it how we want to do it? Of course not. 
Uh, because if you can read it here, or most probably you're familiar with this error, that Angular says that, wait a moment, we have pb card. what it is. If it's a component, why you didn't register it? Why you didn't declare it? If it's a web component, why you didn't tell me? So, okay, we are going to tell it. So, inside the app.module.ts, we are going to say that, okay, we are supporting the custom element schema as well. So, in that way, we are telling Angular that you are going to see some components that they look like Angular components, but they are web components. So, now we created that. So, we added uh, an existing Angular uh, web component to our project as well. So, up to here, we found that what was the uh, web component fundamentals. We created one. And then we add, we created one with Angular as well. And then we found it out that no matter that what type of web components, how we created it, what we need to do is that we should import it and use it. And of course, we should tell Angular that we are sup we supporting the uh, custom element schema as well. So, shall we say that web component rock? My honest opinion, they do rock. Because, first of all, it, uh, they allow us to have those reusable components across the project. And uh, a lot of frameworks, including Angular, are already supporting it, so we can have the advantage of all the toolings that Angular provides for us. And there are already a lot of companies that adopted it, no matter small or big. One of my very favorite success stories is Ionic. Have you ever used of Ionic, any of you? So, Ionic used to be totally bonded to the Angular. It's a, by the way, it's a, it's a kind of a framework that allows you to create the applications for mobile phones with JavaScript. So, it used to be totally bonded with Angular. Uh, it was good for us, not for the other frameworks. And what they did, the Ionic team, they created um, um, a library called Stencil.js, and with the Stencil.js, they converted all the components that they have to the web component, and as a result of that, Ionic today is, you can use it with React, you can use it with Vue as well. And by the way, Stencil.js is really good library also to create web component. The other thing is that uh, a lot of um, big companies, they also uh, adopted the web components as well. Uh, ING Bank and BBVA Bank in Spain, the, they are one of the pioneers to deploy the features in, uh, with web components, so it works. And I also heard it from one of my uh, ex-colleagues. I used to work at Nordia Bank. And uh, they also said that they are also adopted the web components, and then they have it in production with IA11 and also React. So you see that it works. So um, I don't think that there is any reason that you don't use it. And speaking of the i11 and browsers, so browsers are also ready. If you see here that almost all the browsers, they, they, they adopted it. And um, there are, and as, as, as I told you that there are polyfills, so you can, you can already use it. There is no reason to not use it. Okay, so. We know that what web components are. So what are the stuff that we should have track of? Uh, what, is, what is next? Lit HTML. Lit HTML is a project that is also by Polymer team. And um, there is a, one of the main maintainer of it is a guy called Justin Finiani. Uh, that we don't have time to go through everything. But I put the, actually that one here. Ah, OK. I, Better not use it. So, so we have this one, this video here that is talking about that what lit HTML is. I totally recommend you to go and watch it. But this is what I, I talked about it earlier about that JSX. So you can so you, it brings us all the flexibility of the JSX provide and also the change detection. Uh, but in a, in a way that is closer to the native world, so it's not another templating one, templating tag. And the way that the 
um, the change detection works is pretty powerful. Imagine that you have inside of your template, you have that name of a strawberry that is suddenly changed. The way that the lead HTML works, it only renders that part of the DOM. It's not going to render everything. So this is pretty powerful, and this is pretty fast. Uh, so I want to show you that how easy it is uh, to actually to, to use it. I already explained this one. And so inside that template that we already have, what we do is that we are going to import render and HTML from lit, lit uh, HTML. The rest is the same. In connected callback, this time we are calling the lead HTML render function. And we pass the shadow DOM and our render function to that one. And our render function this time, if you can, if you see here, it return and HTML literals. And how does it look like our template? It just looks like almost the one that we have it in Angular as well. So you can see that we have that. You should be familiar with that because most of you already today you are using lit HTML. Uh, you are using HTML literals. So your template is going to be consist of the lit uh, the HTML literals, and it also has a lot of directive as well, um, just like the one that Angular has it. So your HTML is going to be like this, and that's it. So we already created that, but what we achieve, we shipped fewer line of code to the to the client, and also we could achieve all that um, the change detection. Um, um, we should we achieve the performance by using the change detection strategy that lit HTML has it. Okay, what's next? It's lit element actually. And uh, lead element is my very favorite project right now. It's also by the Justin Fignani and Polymer team. And this is the link that, um, that Justin Fignani is talking about the uh, lead element in Chrome Dev Summit in November. And uh, it talks about all the things that you, you can do with it. And it's pretty mind blowing. I totally uh, recommend you to go and watch that video. So we can, I'm going to uh, actually tell you that in a high level that what it is. So it's, you can look at it as a base class for your web component. So it provides a lot of those APIs. So as a result of that, a lot of those things that you had to do it manually, for example, calling the render function in the connected callback, attribute change, you have to call it manually and all of those things, it takes care of it for you. And, um, and then with the help of lead HTML, so it also provides all of the things that lead HTML also provided for you. And, um, and it's extremely fast and extremely light. And I can show you that how easy you can use it. So your component is going to look like this. So just like the way that we did it in Angular, for example, you can define your input. And, and then, Later on, you don't need to actually go and call that render function anyway. You just put your HTML, your template there on the render function, and it automatically call it when it's necessary. And it's automatically going to take care of the changing your input as well. So this is how we actually we could easily uh, use that one as well. And I put this slide here from that. Because lit HTML, uh, lit element actually comes with a lot of directive and a lot of flexibility for your application. If you look at this one here, that uh, what he shows is that inside your render function, you can asynchronously load some data. In this case, it's a, from a file that it gets from an input. And you can have those different states that if it's loading, so you just put whatever that you want to put there, if there is an error, show the error. If something is missing, you just put that. And when the content is read, just render, uh, just render the content. And remember, as I told you, that those content is going to be changed instantly, and the change detection is going to be only for that node. So this is the power of lead element. And uh, yeah, you should totally go and watch that video, in my opinion. So the other thing that you need to be aware of that is the shadow part. 
Uh, this is what I told you that you can use those custom CSS properties, but you should not have too many of that because it's going to be difficult. CSS shadow part is the one that is going to help you to do it. And there is that, uh, actually, the, uh, there is a link to it to an article there that I totally recommend you to go and, and read that article that it explains everything in detail. But in a very high level, imagine you have this component. It's a foo, and anything that in the middle is your, your actually inside your shadow DOM. And you have one div that uh, you give an attribute called some box. And you have one that you have uh, an input which is some input, and you have a part of your component, your template, that you don't want to let anyone to touch it. <laughs> so what we want to do is that we want to give the possibility to the developers that they go and uh, they they totally change every styling inside that that part that we allow it to do. For example, you can see here that. Where you, where you are using your, uh, your actually your, your calling your custom element, you can have a CSS there and say that, OK, the name of my component was x.foo. It has a part, which was some box. Go and apply all of this CSS there to that part. Or you can go one step farther and say that, oh, I want to change the behavior of as soon as the mouse is going to hover that part. You can do that as well. Or you can even go one step farther and say that inside that part with the input, I have the placeholder and go and do that. And you can actually do it as many nested as you want to. And you can even have a component there that it also has some shadow part as well. So um, Monica, who wrote the, the article, it explained all of those things. I totally recommend you to go and watch that, uh, read that one. And uh, so I would say that Web component rock. I hope that you also think that they do rock. And the other thing is that I believe that Angular love web component because it was one of the very first frameworks that is totally supported it, and it keep bringing a lot of different toolings uh, for for the web components. So I want to thank you all for coming to this talk. As I told you that I normally give this talk with my friend Anna Citre. Uh, I wanted her to be also here but she couldn't make it. And, uh, and uh, yes, if you have any questions or anything, I'm here to answer. And after I, um, I share my slide, there are a lot of uh, resources there that you can go and watch it. Thank you very much. <laughs>